He's been an active part of our Louvre team for Louvre Atlanta, has organized a symposium for us on Raphael, and really is one of the most knowledgeable people on this subject. So you're here for a very special night. You're in for a treat. And without further ado, I welcome Gary Radke. Thank you very much, Virginia. Uh, please excuse my voice, and if I stop occasionally to uh, take a drink of water or something, I've come down with some kind of winter cold, but uh, it doesn't in any way dull my enthusiasm for the topic of Italian Renaissance art and uh, the ideas of what it meant to be a person in the Renaissance. This lecture uh, has been advertised as a way to look at Castiglione, whose portrait by Raphael is on display here at the museum from the Musée du Louvre. And it will do that, but in perhaps a slightly different way than you might have imagined. That is, I'm trying to establish a context for understanding Raphael and um, Castiglione through the courtly milieu in which they uh, lived and worked, and in terms of the customs and behaviors that were dictated by Castiglione in his famous book, on the court here. I thus have chosen a rather strangely modified slide for my first title slide, a man without a head, a man without a face, because we're going to try to fill that in, to get a sense of who is the Renaissance man, uh, what might he look like. Now, most people, if they had heard the term Renaissance man, probably would not have said, right from the very beginning, uh, Raphael Castiglione, although I'm going to make a strong case, I believe that they are, in fact, the epitomes of being Renaissance men. But probably Leonardo da Vinci, who may be represented in this drawing that uh, many people think is a, a portrait of the wise old Leonardo. Leonardo epitomized in many ways aspects that uh, were important to Raphael's art that in fact shaped the way in which Castiglione viewed the world. And so I want to briefly uh, review some of his musings, his uh, accomplishments, and then we'll move on to looking more closely at the specific world in which uh, Castiglione and Raphael worked. One of the great subjects of Renaissance art, of being a Renaissance man, was learning about the human body learning about its structure, learning about anatomy by studying it both inside and out. As we see in the famous drawing on the left of the so-called Vitruvian Man by Leonardo, the idea was not only just to learn about the accumulation of parts, but to perhaps understand something of the divine nature, of the logic that was in that human body, how a human, ideally proportioned human, might, according to the uh, ancient uh, Roman uh, architectural writer Vitruvius, be fit both into a circle and into a square, those two most perfect and most uh, 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 solid uh, forms of, uh, of uh, our uh, uh, composition in, in this kind of case. So Renaissance people were looking at the world not just to understand its infinitesimal variety, but also to try to understand its rules, to try to understand something of the logic of the underlying structures that were at work here. Leonardo, of course, is particularly famous for having gotten literally inside the Renaissance man, having uh, dissected uh, people, having pulled up apart their brains uh, and uh, literally done a pop-up view of the brain, having been sawed off the top of the head here in the cranium and the eyes here that would have been snuggled down into the cranium in incredibly detailed uh, studies of the different vertebrae, of the, the vein systems and of others, so, so that the living motion, the sense of the, the, the body and the energy with which it was created and with which it moved could be revealed. Leonardo, like the artist and writer we're talking about uh, tonight, was also fascinated with natural phenomena like flowers and uh, natural uh, motifs. Uh, the famous drawing on the right-hand side of the Star of Bethlehem is of a flower that has this wonderful uh, foliage that sort of circles around and works in sinewy curves. But in Leonardo's work and in the goals of Castiglione and Raphael, 
uh, the goal of all of art was to make, in fact, nature come alive, to make us have a sense that the world is not something static, that we're not looking just at scientific uh, samples that have been pinned to a board like a dead butterfly or another insect, but rather the very essence of life is pulsing in there and what that order and rationality behind it all might be. Couldn't... Uh, start this lecture with Leonardo without at least uh, paying a little bit of attention to uh, his studies of flight. And uh, I do that first because it's, it's in some ways a peculiarity of uh, Leonardo, but also because it suggests to me uh, the essence of being a Renaissance man, and that is to take wing, quite literally, to look above and beyond where people had looked uh, previously, to try to understand the swooping of the birds on the left-hand side and then apply it on the right-hand side to some kind of, of structure that would have been helicopter-like uh, in its form. Uh, Leonardo was also a great mapper a cartographer, as were so many of these Renaissance people. They got to know their world both through, as it were, the microscope and through the telescope, neither of which had yet been quite invented, but uh, which gave us a sense of the world in a kind of Olympian height, as here we look over Tuscany and see some little towns and maps and practical things that were important there. Now, Leonardo, like Raphael and Castiglione, also was involved in these kinds of activities because in the Renaissance, the Renaissance artist was useful. The Renaissance artist was hired to do things and to know things that other people simply did not know. Leonardo, for example, was asked to chart these areas of Tuscany so that a great uh, navigation system might be put in, it was never accomplished, but that might be built to connect Florence uh, to Pisa. Similarly, Raphael and Castiglione mapped the ruins of Rome, trying to reconstruct and understand the world that had been and the world that they wanted to recreate in their Renaissance guise. All of these artists, all of these writers, were also in, very much involved in theater, in court festivities, in uh, spectacles. Here we have two drawings for costumes for a spectacular multimedia uh, event that Leonardo uh, orchestrated at the court in Milan, where he had uh, literally angels in the sky and twirling globes and a kind of Cirque du Soleil uh, kind of experience for his people, a world that was full of dramatic uh, uh, proportion and that was there uh, to show us what could be done. Again, on a practical function, artists were called to create architecture. And here is his designs for a set, some centralized churches with these, again, perfect geometric forms, circles and octagons and squares combined together to create a sense of the divine origins and the divine uh, character of the world uh, around him. Raphael was also an architect. I won't be speaking about his architectural works tonight, but I wanted to bring this in as to suggest to you the range of what it meant to be a Renaissance man, a Renaissance artist in this uh, period. And finally, in terms of my Leonardo slides, the practical engineering things that artists and architects and, and uh, writers were asked to do. On the left, a series of, of machines for bringing water up to high reservoirs. On the bottom right, a machine for dredging the Arno River. On the upper right, uh, a kind of tank, uh, a uh, war machine. And we mustn't idealize the Renaissance man. The Renaissance man was a military man. The Renaissance man was a man of of, uh, of arms. Uh, Castiglione was a count, but he also was a military leader. He took troops uh, into battle, and war was, in fact, one of the major businesses for which art and this, all this Renaissance thinking was directed. Now, perhaps in some ways, up until now, uh, for those of you who know something about Renaissance art, this is rather familiar. I'd like to show you one other image, however, that maybe will set you off a little uh, and will suggest to you where I really want to go with the rest of this lecture. <laughs> and that is James Bond. Bond, James. Because when we talk about the Renaissance man, I think besides the Renaissance artist who's creative, we have to think about the man who is the great lover. We have to think about the man who was clever and witty and yet always cool, calm, and collected. 
The Renaissance man I want to talk to you about tonight is a man who is so aware of the world around him, who has studied all of these things which we have uh, seen illustrated in Leonardo's uh, work, that he can charm the ladies as well as lead the troops, as well as write great poetry, as well as be an advisor to kings and princes. The Renaissance man, in fact, that I'm going to be primarily talking about is the courtier, the Renaissance uh, advisor to the prince, the man who was uh, at the very center of court life in, in the Renaissance and who had to have multiple skills in so many of the things we've talked about and others uh, yet to come. Now, here they are, our characters, Baldassare Castiglione and Raphael Sanzio on, on the right-hand uh, side. Uh, they are, if we wanted to think of it on the simplest levels, in fact, the James Bonds of the 16th century, insofar as each of them was, in fact, a renowned ladies' man. This is uh, Raphael's portrait of the Fornarina. The Fornarina, uh, whether this is really she or not, we're not sure, but by uh, tradition, this is said to be a portrait of Raphael's uh, girlfriend, of, of the baker's daughter whom he fell in love with uh, and uh, who, according to Giorgio Vasari, the great teller of tales and the writer of Renaissance history, was uh, the ultimate cause of Raphael's premature death. He literally loved himself out. But he is here claiming her with his name, Raphael from Urbino, Urbinis, right on the uh, this very peculiar bracelet that's put up here. She is obviously rather suggestively showing off her breasts. Her other hand is not uh, any less uh, suggestive as, as well. Her eyes are glinting to the side. These are people who live real lives, who are flesh and blood human beings, not just uh, people of ideal forms. Castiglione also had a lot to say about love and about its beauty, and he wrote in the Courtier, one can truly say that eyes are the guides of love, especially if they are graceful and soft and blue in color. <laughs> the James Bond of the 16th century needs to be aware of his own beauty, his own handsomeness, as well as that uh, of others. Now I'd like to sort of step back and give us a sense of where we are uh, geographically in terms of uh, this uh, uh, lecture. We're going to be looking primarily at works that uh, were produced in, in Rome, uh, in Urbino, and in Mantua, three of the greatest courts of the Renaissance. Raphael was born in Urbino. Castiglione met Raphael there uh, and, uh, in fact, wrote his famous book of the courtier celebrating the courtly life in Urbino. Mantua is where Castiglione himself was born and where he learned to be a courtier, both here and in, in Milan, where he was uh, uh, trained to, for this life of sophistication and of, of elegance. They combined their talents together in Rome, where uh, at the papal court of uh, Julius II and Leo X, they were uh, really some of the greatest uh, collaborators of, of their age. Let's start in Urbino. As I said, it was there that Raphael was born, and it was there that he learned to be a courtier. Uh, Urbino is a very small uh, principality. Uh, it uh, has no uh, real natural resources around it. It is, even today, rather isolated in the um, eastern uh, areas of the mountainous uh, areas just up from the coast of, of Italy. But it was a place where if you wanted to be an elegant person, if you wanted to be a courtly person, if you wanted to learn how to be a Renaissance man, you could not have been born in a better place. For it was a court that was renowned for its learning, a court that was renowned for uh, its uh, dedication to the arts uh, and letters. Raphael uh, was uh, apprenticed to his father, uh, who was court painter there, and learned how to please uh, his prince, uh, and then took the learning that he got from that court uh, to those others, other places. The man for whom Urbino, from whom... Uh, for, from whom Urbino has gotten its greatest fame, is the Duke of Urbino, Federico de Montefeltro. 
And I want to talk a bit about him because it was he who created the great palace that we see here where Raphael would have worked as a young man and where he would have gotten his sense of what the Renaissance uh, was about. But also because, um, for me, uh, Federico da Montefeltro epitomizes what is unique about being a Renaissance man. Now, while the goal of being a Renaissance man was to be as handsome as possible, while it was the goal to be as sophisticated as possible, you can tell by looking at this detail that the man has a certain number of flaws. First of all, of course, he has uh, he had rather warty skin, and this is uh, actually a rather idealized portrait by Piero della Francesca that doesn't even show uh, the uh, strange uh, skin disease he suffered from. But he's most renowned for his aquiline nose, which is uh, the result of an injury that he suffered as a young man. As a young man, he was in a tournament, and in that uh, tournament, uh, his opponent uh, mistakenly uh, put the lance right into his uh, right eye. Uh, Federico, therefore, asked uh, the surgeon who was repairing uh, the now-gone uh, eye, so eye and eye socket to saw away the bridge of his nose so that he could still be an effective military captain, so he could still see. Now, I can't quite imagine what this man must really have looked like, a kind of cyclops with his eye that would have been darting back and forth from left to right, trying to take in the world. But why I consider Federico da Montefeltro the ultimate Renaissance man is that in the end, it didn't matter what he looked like. What mattered was who he was, what he did, and how he changed the world. He had one of the greatest libraries in 15th century Italy. He encouraged scholars to come and join him at that court. He was a person who was beautiful for his learning, beautiful for what he had learned about the world and in his uh, dealings with others. He was, in fact, so effective at dealing with others that he not only made a few huge fortune by being hired out to different cities to be their military captain, but he convinced them to pay him not to fight. And so he was able to spend most of his time uh, interested in his manuscripts, interested in the uh, scholarly uh, effects that were so important in this uh, world that uh, we're discussing. This is his famous studiolo, uh, the world of the Renaissance man where uh, people are dedicated to study where, in fact, it is important at times to retreat to a very small space, in this case, in the, the uh, palace at Urbino, where we have intarsia, inlaid uh, wood cabinets that look as though they uh, have three dimension and yet are completely flat, this beautiful play and, and uh, fun kind of alteration of uh, our expectation. And then above paintings, which uh, depict the great men of, of letters and of philosophy from both ancient, medieval, and contemporary time, joining together the interests and the knowledge uh, that was received over the centuries from the Greco-Roman tradition, from the Christian tradition, uh, and, and in fact, in some cases, uh, from the Islamic and other uh, Eastern traditions uh, as well. Now, Piero del Francesco, who did this portrait, uh, was asked to create it as part of a double portrait, a portrait with Battista Sforza, the wife of Federico da Montefeltro, and Federico himself. Um, and here's where I have to say a few words about being a Renaissance woman. Uh, the words are not too good. Uh, they, uh, for the most part, at least from our standards, uh, the role of women was, in fact, extremely limited in the Renaissance. Women were expected to be modest, to be chaste, to always have their eyes cast downward. Women were expected to uh, be the loyal but unquestioning supporters of their husbands. Now, there are some beautiful exceptions in Isabella d'Este and a few other uh, women of this uh, period, but for the most part, I think Battista Sforza actually does uh, epitomize the kind of, of woman that uh, was the counterpart to being a Renaissance man. And behind every great Renaissance man, there was a great, uh, almost every Renaissance man was a, a great Renaissance woman. Batista's letters survive uh, her correspondence with Federico. <coughs> and in that correspondence, we sense her very, uh, really, 
incisive intelligence, her great care, care for uh, her uh, uh, prince and, and her uh, husband, uh, but uh, a kind of reticence to act on her own that uh, was not expected, of course, of, of males at all. Here they are uh, again uh, as they uh, face one another. The very way in which they are presented, the worlds in which that they inhabit, is suggested by Piero to discern between or distinguish between the Renaissance man and the Renaissance woman. Federico's world is one that is open, that has great rivers and channels and ships, that is a world that is going to be connected out to the rest of the world. Batista's world, on the other hand, is guarded by castles and uh, by uh, uh, forts and, and by walls. Uh, her world is much more constrained and protected and uh, <coughs> in that way uh, controlled. She is in some ways not exactly a portrait of her jewels, but uh, it is her ornaments and she as an ornament to her man that matters uh, most. We can get a good sense of what Renaissance men and women thought of these ideal ro uh, roles by comparing the two inscriptions that are on the back of these paintings, one for uh, Federico and one for um, uh, Batista. Federico's is celebratory. He that the perennial fame of virtues rightly celebrates holding the scepter, equal to the highest duke, the illustrious, is born in triumph. Batista, she that kept her modesty in favorable circumstances flies on the mouth of all men, adorned with the praise of the acts of her great husband. Now this was a posthumous portrait, we're pretty sure. Uh, and uh, in fact, it is interesting that the uh, tenses are present tense for uh, Federico and past tense for um, uh, Batista. But still, it suggests to us the different worlds that we inhabit and therefore the unequal relationships that we have to keep in mind. This sort of sense of the woman as much more restrained, as much more, um, uh, in a, in a, in a, not, if not a completely subservient, at least in a controlling, quietly controlling uh, role, I think is communicated quite clearly to us by Raphael's lovely portrait of Elisabetta Gonzaga. In this period, uh, he is portraying the woman who was going to preside and did preside in the idealized conversations that Castiglione records in his book of the courtier. But she, uh, very little of her personality comes across. She is in many ways, again, a kind of, 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 of emblem of, of purity. But there was power in that purity. It was she who brought the conversations of every day to order. It was she who turned the conversation when it got out of control. It was she who ended the conversation uh, each day. So like our traditional grandmothers or perhaps even some of our, our mothers, there was a kind of, of a stern uh, role that let daddy think he was in charge, but that uh, showed that she had power as well. Raphael went to Florence. And when he went to Florence, he saw the Mona Lisa. And immediately his approach to women and to Renaissance people in general changed. Leonardo was so full of life and so full of this uh, human and uh, intellectual and, and natural sense that he began first to draw the Mona Lisa or a virgin uh, of that, a young woman, uh, be set before a set of columns uh, as originally flanked the Mona Lisa, as we see here just a bit that is uh, remnant uh, over here on, on, the, on the side. And for the first time, Leonardo broke through and had a woman directly looking out at us. A woman who was intelligent. A woman who was, in fact, in control of her own destiny. So uh, while it was a slower development, uh, both in art and in culture, uh, the Renaissance uh, woman does begin to emerge in this period. Raphael began painting portraits of other women uh, where he clearly used the model <coughs> of the Mona Lisa for his uh, representation. Madalena Strozzidoni, probably painted here for her uh, wedding, 
just after he had uh, gotten to uh, uh, Florence, uh, shows uh, a, a great knowledge of that general pose and of the kind of sense of presence and of self that Leonardo had done so beautifully in the Mona Lisa. But for our purposes, perhaps what's most interesting to me is that we also see the influence of this ideal but now uh, sh epic shattering, really innovative uh, female portrait on male portraits, in particular on the portrait of Baldessare Castiglione. Normally, Renaissance men were either shown as bust length, just cut like Roman uh, sculptures, or they were shown standing there with their great spears or with their swords or with their shields. Castiglione's portrait is created by, by Raphael, on the other hand, suggests to us that he has looked at the Mona Lisa very carefully, Her, the folded hands, the uh, hands that are actually put across the belly, uh, had not previously been seen in representations of male uh, uh, figures. This then suggests or asks us to consider, well, what then is this ideal Renaissance man? Is he, in fact, the uh, he-man? No. He is, rather, uh, the uh, calm and the collected. He is the man who is the thinking uh, genius, who, in fact, may, in fact, embody many of the best of what we traditionally have called uh, female virtues as well. We know what Castiglione thought was the best of behavior because he wrote this famous book of the courtier, which he set in 1508 at the court of Urbino and then wrote the first draft of what of while he was in Rome with uh, Raphael uh, working at the papal uh, court. The Book of the Courtier is a series of conversations that take over, place over several nights in which members of the court, both men and women, gather to talk about, uh, to have some kind of entertainment. They decide that their subject is going to be what is the ideal courtier? What is the ideal uh, Renaissance man? And since we have that book, and since we have uh, Castiglione's uh, words, I thought it would be useful for us to review what those um, uh, prescriptions were for this kind of work. First, and perhaps disturbing to our egalitarian sense, is if you want to be a courtier, if you want to be a gentleman, if you want to be the Renaissance man, it'd be a good idea if you were of noble birth and good family. That's because nobility, of course, counted so much that um, line and patrilineage was so important. Uh, there's a series of conversations in which people say, but there are always those who rise up from the lower classes and will distinguish themselves. And they consider that for a while, and they say, yeah, but isn't it even better when a nobleman rises to that uh, standard and isn't even more likely that because he has a good family, because he has the right upbringing, it's important. So the very place in which you're born is important. As I already indicated to you, it's important to be a military man, to bear arms expertly, stand out as enterprising, bold, and loyal. Now, when we look at this portrait, we don't necessarily think of that aspect uh, of Castiglione, but he does have the hilt of his sword uh, uh, here, and uh, the uh, uh, Renaissance uh, man uh, would have been expected not only to be able to do arms, but to fence and to do other kinds of, of more elegant military uh, tournament-style uh, activities. This I like. He's not to be too small nor too big. Uh, everything in moderation. Um, if you are oversized, you will uh, be uh, a, a giant. And of course, if you're too small, you simply won't make enough of an impression. You'll get lost in the crowd. Uh, this is followed by the recommendation that he be a good wrestler. <laughs> So you're to be athletic as well. You are to know how to use your body. You know how to use your body and to fight in uh, a very prescribed, almost choreographed uh, uh, sort of way. You are to be able to ride horses, which of course has practical utility as well as the utility of going out and being a huntsman and enjoying the pleasures of, of the hunt that were only uh, allowed to the uh, uh, great aristocrats. And then you could swim, you could hunt, you could jump, you could run, and you could play tennis. That uh, I just bought a, a book that just came out on uh, tennis, which I had not realized was uh, very, very popular in the Renaissance. Many of the uh, Renaissance palaces had tennis courts, and Baldessare Castiglione grew up in Mantua, where there was a great tennis court at the main uh, palace. Now, there's many other things, though. This would not be a full prescription for a Renaissance man. 
you also have to be a good dancer. And by being a good dancer, you had to make it look as though you were just natural. You were not to show off. You were not to do wild spins and turns. You were not to be uh, an extravagant showman or, in fact, so nonchalant that it was clearly some kind of, of show, but rather that you were, uh, knew the rules and you could do the very slight, subtle variations on the steps. You could write and speak well, and in particular, Castiglione suggested, in the native vernacular, in the words of uh, Italian. Uh, and this um, is something that isn't relatively new. For before this, uh, throughout the Middle Ages, Latin, of course, had been the general language of the uh, aristocrats, as well as French in the later uh, Middle Ages. And now the vernacular Italian was thought to be very important, but that one should speak naturally not use the words of Boccaccio or the words of Dante or the words of uh, high literature. In other words, not for us to speak like Shakespeare, but rather to speak in the language of the 21st century. And when you speak, you're to have a good voice. You're supposed to have a nice, round, and full voice, not some kind of tweaky little voice, nor something so bold that it would be uh, really uh, overwhelming. In terms of your learning, Baldessari Castiglione prescribes that you know Greek as well as Latin, that you read music and you play several instruments, and then, surprisingly, at least in terms of prior uh, recommendations for how to be a gen gentleman, how to be a courtier, Castiglione also recommends that you paint and draw. And this, of course, uh, both reveals his uh, great love for and his relationship with uh, art and artists in, in, in the own period, but also some research that he did as he was reading an ancient text, and they praised artists, and they praised the work of people who had come before them. Now, no guidebook is going to be just positive things. There also has to be the shall nots. What should you not do? No acrobatics. <laughs> Nothing in excess and you are to avoid affectation. Uh, the goal in all of this, according to Castiglione, is to practice in all things a certain nonchalance, which conceals all artistry and makes whatever one says or does seem uncontrived and effortless. Now, this is the real key to understanding what it meant to be a Renaissance man. You had to work very, very hard to learn how to do all these things that Castiglione has done, uh, told us to do. You have to master it so completely that you then can make it look as though it was never any effort at all, as though it never was a, uh, a hard battle to learn those steps or to uh, mount that horse or to uh, learn how to play uh, the instrument that, that's there. <coughs> what uh, Castiglione uh, said was that you were to invent uh, a, a kind of persona that had a delightful freedom that was, came out of all of this attention, attention to rules. And that is what he coined the term sprezzatura to um, indicate. True art is what does, not, what does not seem to be art. And I think if we look at the portrait of Castiglione again by Raphael, perhaps we sense that. It's an understated uh, portrait, limited in its palette, limited uh, in terms of its uh, setting. There is no background. There's just a bit, a tiny bit of an indication of, of a chair, uh, just a general kind of illumination. And yet it is a tour de force of this artless artfulness, of this sense of sprezzatura, this beautiful line that he picks up in the hat with its uh, back and forth and, and turning, the distinctions between the beard and the beautiful white um, uh, shirt and the fur and, and every other form, that the longer you look at this painting, and especially when you see it in person, which is such a great joy for us uh, here for the uh, next short uh, uh, time, you are constantly amazed by how gracefully and artfully every detail is attended to and yet never overdone, never uh, exaggerated. Now, were Castiglione and uh, Raphael, did, how did they measure up to these, this prescription? Uh, since uh, Castiglione wrote this, we'd hope that he me measured up, and in fact, we have evidence that he did. Uh, when he was a young man, he was at the court of Milan, 
Uh, and uh, the uh, Duke of Milan wrote back to his father and said, your young man is exceedingly handsome, learned, eloquent, discreet, and singularly virtuous. In fact, so generously endowed by nature and fortune that it would be hard to find his equal. So Castiglione is not only the James Bond uh, lover, but he is also uh, the, the handsome, the learned, the uh, skillful, the uh, virtuous uh, uh, Renaissance man. Raphael, similarly so, no less excellent than graceful. He was endowed by nature with all modesty and goodness, writes Giorgio uh, Vasari. The courtier was not to be uh, a superb person, that is, a person who uh, had his nose uh, in the air, but rather a person who was modest, who had the appearance of a person who was at peace uh, with himself. Raphael, again, according to Vasari, taught us by his life in what manner we should comport ourselves towards great men as well as towards those of lower degree and even toward the lowest. So although we're dealing with a very stratified society here, what we're finding in the works that uh, are associated with uh, Castiglione and Raphael is a sense of, of people who so know their station in life, who are so secure with who they are, that they can treat all people well, and that both Raphael and Castiglione embody this, uh, this, this mode. <clears throat> now, you may have begun to think that this gentleman, as artless and artful as he was, was could, have, could have ended up being rather a bore. But I want to uh, spend the last part of this lecture talking a bit about Renaissance humor uh, and a little bit about what we see in this work. Uh, let him just laugh, just banter, romp, and dance. Now, just because we do know this is Castiglione writing, in a fashion that always reflects good sense and discretion, always has to be balanced. <coughs> but as you read through uh, the works here, you begin to understand that the uh, Renaissance enjoyed a great deal of, of humor, enjoyed uh, things that we might even call cruel today, uh, a kind of humor that we, uh, is certainly not politically correct and is not in, in any way uh, necessarily uh, the most uh, uh, pleasant. <coughs> Excuse me. Castiglione, for his part, might have early learned about humor in Mantua, where the ceiling in the main reception room of uh, Federico Gonzaga has this marvelous uh, fictive dome, fictive um, lantern uh, in the center of the ceiling. It's all actually completely uh, flat, where we have a balustrade with these very curious and almost sort of ugly putti. Uh, ones, whoa, uh, you told me that might happen. There we go, let's go. Some who it actually uh, we see from the rear end up, uh, others who've gotten their heads uh, stuck into the uh, balustrade, others who are sticking their hands out. Well, now you're getting the rest of my good slides there. Okay, there we go. And where there is something delightfully uh, dangerous about what's going on. Notice that there is a big oaken bucket here filled with some kind of plant life, but it is balancing on the edge of this uh, uh, circular opening with what clearly looks like a rod or a rolling uh, pin. Uh, are these women who are looking down so smilingly uh, at the courtiers about to let that go? Is it going to be pushed uh, on you? Uh, is this, in fact, going to be one of the infamous practical jokes uh, of the Renaissance? The Renaissance loved playing practical jokes. Uh, one of the best and most famous of the practical jokes is associated with Filippo Brunelleschi, the great architect of Florence uh, Cathedral in the Dome of Florence, where he and his friends convinced a friend of theirs that he was someone else and threw him in jail and turned him into somebody else and never to the end did he ever figure out who he was. The Renaissance uh, had wonderful kinds of uh, a little retorts that were sweet. Uh, here's one that Castiglione reports. He lacks nothing but brains and money. Or, he was an idiot to die just as he was getting rich. Or, rather distastefully, but again indicative of Renaissance attitudes by Renaissance men to Renaissance women, when a man heard that a woman, uh, a man's wife had just committed suicide on an olive tree, the man, another man came up to him and said, could I have a branch of that tree to uh, graft onto one of my own? 
Now, this is sick humor. This is to encourage his wife to commit suicide uh, as well. Italians love puns, and uh, unfortunately, they don't work very well when you translate them uh, into English, but I'll tell you that, indeed, uh, one of the great playful things that Castiglione and others uh, enjoyed uh, was puns, and we're very lucky that we have even a story that is told by, about Raphael and a joke that he played, or at least uh, uh, some humor that he uh, uh, used uh, to some cardinals. Raphael had painted a painting of St. Uh, Peter and Paul, uh, and uh, two cardinals came to see it. Now, you must remember in the Renaissance, cardinals are dressed like this in red. And the cardinals, supposedly to make conversation, said to the artist, you know, those, the, the flesh tones on that, those two saints, they're, it's awfully red. It's, uh, I'm surprised that you made them so red. And Raphael, without skipping a beat, said, well, Saints Peter and Paul are red in the face because they have people like you who are running our church, wearing red, being red in the face, quite literally. Cardinal Bibiena, this is a portrait by Raphael uh, of, uh, of one of these cardinals, uh, was uh, a great friend of this uh, uh, group of people, and he wrote uh, regularly uh, comedies for performance at the papal and other uh, courts. And here we see him rather slyly looking out at us, uh, breaking just a bit of a grin, knowing uh, that. And I was just fascinated when Michael Shapiro sent me this postcard that is a, of a modern uh, variation on this uh, 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 thing that he saw in a, in a work uh, an artist um, gallery in, in New York City. There's fun, but I really had fun when I came across this on the internet, your pet's photo here. Now we find that perhaps disrespectful and absurd, but now, I'm, now you're getting at the sense of Renaissance humor. You're understanding that these uh, uh, people uh, uh, could in fact uh, imagine and play for all the seriousness of the world, of all the uh, importance of what they were doing, that they could also take into account uh, these kinds of, of things. Uh, one last example that uh, may suggest to us the sense of humor and of delight in the Renaissance that made a Renaissance man uh, centers around the Villa Farnesina in Rome, built by the uh, uh, Sienese banker Agostino Chigi. It was decorated by Raphael with uh, wonderful frescoes in the loggia and throughout um, the rooms. Uh, it is, in general, a festive place, a place of pleasure, a place of, of delight. Uh, one's inside a space, and yet one senses uh, that one is under an arbor that has uh, been brought together, and the tapestries have been strung on the ceiling, even though this is all flat plaster and uh, merely uh, painted. Uh, it is here that uh, the Villa Farnesina, where great banquets uh, were held. Kiji had so much money that he was renowned for regularly having uh, banquets where he served everything on gold and silver plates. And then, in an act of total noblesse oblige, he would throw the plates into the Tiber River. Now, what he didn't tell his guests was that he had nets and fishermen who were there getting his plates in this great rinse and hold cycle for his uh, 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 plates. Um, this kind of playing and of bending slightly the expectation uh, is so much of what uh, Renaissance art and Renaissance uh, uh, culture was about. <coughs> Even in the most serious parts of the Villa Farnesina, here, for example, where Cupid is chastised by Jupiter, there is something wonderfully almost humorous about this. It's, uh, the very serious, almost overly serious uh, Jupiter sort of gives him a chin chuck and says, you know, well, I guess you're going to just be a bad little boy and you're going to do those kinds of things. And then there's delight in all of the illusionism of the leg that seems to be projecting out into our space, of this beautiful sense of play on the natural world that's brought together in its abundance and its variety. There are also uh, other scenes where figures come flying at us, flapping uh, in, the, in the breeze. Uh, Mercury, for example, uh, literally shattering, as it would seem, uh, the space that we see and the space that we're going to. And then 
because the Renaissance liked sex as well, there are uh, rather suggestive combinations here, for example, of, of gourds and of, of chestnuts, of very voluptuous and open kinds of seedy uh, uh, fruit. Uh, this is not a, a prudish uh, society as well, though it was among the educated. It was thought to be appropriate for only those who knew better. Giulio Romano, the great student of Raphael, uh, made the mistake of creating some pornographic prints and widely distributing them. Uh, he was cast out of, of Rome uh, uh, for that, uh, and uh, uh, it was one, people have wondered, what was that about? It was not so much that uh, it was the overly sensuous or overly explicit imagery, but rather that the world of the court was a closed world where those of us who know better, who deserve the pleasures of this life and of uh, our great knowledge, uh, should uh, see it together. So in terms of thinking of the art of being a Renaissance man, I hope you'll have added, perhaps already had, hanging there along with Leonardo, uh, our image of Raphael and of Castiglione, these learned, sophisticated, but absolutely fun-loving and absolutely delightful people and uh, people who, of course, were also James Bond. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, address any uh, questions or comments that you might have, and uh, there's a microphone here that can be brought to you so that other people uh, can see that. Anybody? So, Gary, you shed great insight on two of the great three masters of the Renaissance, uh -huh. and obviously omitted was Michelangelo. How does he fit in, and how does he not fit in into well, your Well, Michelangelo did not have a Renaissance woman behind him until late in his life. But, I mean, in a sense, it worked. He, he never married, but he did have, Michelangelo, a great, important relationship with Vittoria Colonna, the great uh, uh, mystic and uh, Roman noblewoman. So even in a man who was an ultimate masculist, who believed that the male way was the ultimate way, uh, he was... Uh, uh, part of this uh, culture. Uh, Michelangelo had a sense of humor, and I suppose in a certain way it was typically Renaissance uh, uh, humor in that it was biting and acerbic. Um, he he uh, would be constantly writing to his nephew and telling him that, uh, uh, why would anyone want to marry you? You're so ugly. He would uh, chastise uh, people. But he shared the sense of uh, the, the, the sense that you were seeking perfection. It's just that Michelangelo, for us today, is the ultimate Renaissance artist. And yet, for the Renaissance, I think many people found Michelangelo out there, on the edge. Michelangelo fought with the Pope. Raphael never fought with the Pope. Raphael always was calm. Raphael was always diplomatic. Raphael always got his own way. Raphael always worked with a great number of people and was able to uh, marshal the forces of a lot of people. Michelangelo was largely, no, not, though not exclusively, a solitary uh, artist. And Michelangelo was, in the end, sort of obsessed with a single subject. I mean, it was the male figure, and that is expressed in architecture as well as uh, sculpture. So he is, in some ways, the exception. And I think we need to remember that when you think about what the works are in the exhibition here, when we see the Guido Reni and Pietro Corto, da Cortona and other works that show that it was Raphael and his elegance and his understatedness, his balance and his uh, pure uh, form that was so important throughout the whole academic tradition. Only in the 19th century did Michelangelo rise uh, to be the artist uh, to emulate. It was Raphael and it was Castiglione's ideal before that. Yes. But you've got a microphone here, Kevin. The Renaissance, is the Renaissance a term that postdates the Renaissance? Yes. So they didn't think of themselves as Renaissance men, uh, per se. Well, they did talk about rebirth. And they did talk about being, uh, that, this, that they were bringing back to life. But you know, what would the Renaissance man have called himself? I'm sure he would have called himself modern. Uh, that, so yeah. did they have a self-consciousness that they were 
special, that this was a golden age. Yes, that that they clearly had a sense of of that it was a a golden age, and that, in fact, uh, they then uh, made themselves uh, even more aware of that by criticizing other things, anything that was German, anything that was French, anything that was Gothic. This was the bad, Byzantine or Greek. So they vilified certain other styles and other cultures so that they uh, could uh, say that theirs uh, was uh, the best. Uh, But they certainly prized Greece and Rome. But to think of this primarily as being we want to be little Greeks and Romans running around now in Renaissance hose and hats, no. Uh, They they had a very much greater sense of their own self. Yes, modernity, yes. Oh, Okay, well, we'll get you next, okay? Did, did either of these two <laughs> artists share the interest in biological design and anatomy and dissection? No. <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. I mean, Raphael uh, studied the human body, but in terms of, for Raphael, it, uh, he, he studied how figures move, but to get inside, uh, it wasn't as important for him to know all of, of what the, the working mechanism was. It was what the, in the end, the final result, an aspect uh, was. And Castiglione, I have, I have no evidence that uh, he was particularly fascinated with uh, the uh, getting in the interior and, and the anatomy, other than the anatomy of the, the mind, as it were, in, in a kind of very abstract sort of way. How about if we just have that person yell from up there, and then we won't have, we won't have to throw the microphone up to her. Yes. I'm afraid I don't know a lot about uh, relationships to Africa, though I do know that certainly during the period when the um, uh, the exploration was going to the Americas. The Medici, in particular, were making huge collections of what we would now call ethnographic materials, and they did drawings of all of the different headdresses and of all the exotic, and they gathered together the, the world's uh, uh, wonderful um, flora and, and fauna, and so it expanded their knowledge. Uh, there is, in Renaissance art, the constant presence especially in North Italian art, of certain uh, African-seeming figures, uh, but they are often just in painting as to be exotic. Uh, If you're going to show Alexandria in Egypt or if you're going to show uh, something that is uh, a distance away, you'll you'll show uh, those kinds of of forms. In uh, the Rome of the 16th century where Raphael and uh, Castiglione are working, I'm not as aware of uh, that African uh, uh, awareness. In many of the portraits that you showed, the subjects are often looking askance. Mm -hmm. Uh, What what are the roles and reasons for that? Well, certainly in the female uh, portraits, it is simply not to engage you. Uh, But I think with the the male portraits, the looking askance or not looking directly in the eye is to suggest something of the workings of the the, the person that that, uh, Leonardo writes a lot about, how important it is in a painting that you not just show the outside of the person, but that you somehow suggest the actions and motions of his mind. And I think that in many ways is the kind of strategy that they use to try uh, to express that, that there is something that is more than skin deep, and it's not just anatomy, but it's spirit and and thought. Uh, That's what I would attribute it to. There's a question there. I had always associated Florence with the Renaissance man and the Renaissance in general, and I was wondering um, what you could add um, about that area. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, uh, our view, again, of the Renaissance today is so determined by Florence, partly because it's so beautifully preserved. When you go to Florence and you see largely a 14th and 15th century city with some 16th century uh, enhancements, Florence, Florence was very different in some ways from the world that I've been describing tonight, in that it was a mercantile uh, society, uh, where people were uh, involved in, in commerce, where it was uh, not as um, 
let's say, consciously elegant uh, a place. Uh, Florentines were known for their coarse humor, for their uh, straight talk. Uh, it's sort of the difference between, I suppose, uh, um, Paris and New York. I mean, uh, Paris is, is always elegant, is always thought of as, as being a place where there, there's a, a, a courtly sophistication that lives on. New York is the, the, the city of, of commerce. That said, certainly people who lived in Florence, many of these values would have been uh, 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 similar, other than uh, that the merchant did not, uh, for the most part, play tennis. He didn't go uh, hunting. Uh, he uh, uh, w was out uh, doing business. Can I ask if there was any interest amongst these gentlemen in the field of mathematics? Yes, yeah, a great, great deal of interest in, in, in mathematics throughout uh, uh, this uh, uh, period. Um, the, uh, in terms of, are you speaking specifically of Raphael and, and Castiglione? I can't think of a specific example that comes to mind, but certainly in, in Leonardo there is this endless computation, and endless trying to figure out what, in a sense, would be the precursor of formulae and, and other kinds of, of cal calculations. Uh, there is a, a, a sense of measure uh, that is Im important in terms of uh, this world. Uh, back to Florence, uh, the Florentines were renowned for being able to calculate how much many uh, pounds of uh, woolen cloth or, or yards of woolen cloth were sitting in front of you simply by looking at it, simply by doing kinds of mathematical and, and rough calculations in, in one's mind. So I think that the Renaissance person was probably a bit more skilled at that kind of estimation and, and general uh, use of, of, of mathematics. So uh, it's not yet um, something that is required or that is emphasized in, in the curriculum for these uh, particular folks. One last, is that all right? I was struck by um, the quote upstairs next to the portrait that um, Castiglione, I guess, wrote that yes. his wife gazed upon that right. portrait. And I wondered if there, he had written any more about what he thought about the painting. And, oh, yeah. And if it was, would have been seen by people outside their family or, or the role of that portrait. <clears throat> If you can find me that evidence, I will be a happy art historian, so will our colleagues at uh, the Louvre. Uh, we don't even know exactly where it was. We have good circumstantial evidence. It must have gotten to his family home. But remember that that quote is of Castiglione imagining his wife standing in front of his painting and yearning for her dear beloved uh, uh, husband, which I suppose in many ways plays into the themes that I was talking about uh, before. But in terms of, uh, uh, the only th other thing we do know is that Raphael uh, paints a portrait of another one of their uh, friends right after the Castiglione. And um, a, com a mutual friend of theirs says, it's much better than Raphael's portrait of Castiglione. Uh, what, what that means, we don't know. It's just that it makes it even more alive. It's even more the person. It's as though he is even more uh, present. I don't think that is really meant to be a negative uh, evaluation of the Castiglione portrait, but rather just to suggest that as each portrait was made, everyone thought that they just seemed in, in many ways to be getting better and better, more suggesting the richness of who these people were, not just their appearance and their clothes, but their very essence as people. So, thank you very much.